Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Good morning. There's a reason why I went a different route. You know, we do, you know, I mean, we normally start uh, in one book and we go all the way through. Well, this is something that I've noticed is even non-believers know about. You know I mean, you say, you walk up to your friends who are non-believer, hey, I know the Ten Commandments, you know, honor your father and mother, you know, don't worship an idol, you know. I get the general gist, don't murder anyone. Even your favorite TV shows like NCIS, you know, Gibbs, he has his rules. And I mean, you even have a little meaning like, okay, on uh, your partner, trust your partner, that type of thing. But there's a reason why these were given. They were given as guideposts to help us out in this sinful world. So back to basics, we need to understand what these ten laws mean to us. First five this week, and Lord willing, and work scheduling allowing, the five next week. <laughs> the Ten Commandments are there to protect us. I mean, they're not supposed to chain us down. They're there to help us. We are wired to want to sin. The moment we, uh, we come into this world, we're programmed to sin. Before we dive deep into the Ten Commandments, we have to understand the background of the laws and the commandments. I mean, during this time, there were so many different types of laws. The exact there are 613 of them in the Old Testament, and they were given to the nation of Israel. And the Bible is known as the Ten Words. And hopefully I'll chop this up, the Hebrew word dika. I tried. Which means ten words, the importance of the Ten Commandments. These extra commandments are written all over the Old Testament and were a way to have Israel understand that they were to worship the Creator and not the creation. However, they didn't go out like that. It seems like they were worshiping the rules and not the reason for the rules. They had a whole bunch of different rules going on, but they seemed to not understand the sacrifice that God made for them. He was sending his only son to die on a cross, not the rules. These commandments were the instructions and in how they were to live and show the sinfulness of the world without the grace of God. And they are doomed to be like the Israelites. The 603 extra commandments are numerous. You know, don't touch a dead body. You know, wash your hands this way, not this way. You know, you, you could spend forever on it. At work, we have rules and regulations. You know, it's about this inch of a book. I mean, this was their instruction manual on how they were supposed to live. But instead of understanding the importance of why they had the instruction manual, they were just following the rules. They didn't understand that it was all about a relationship. You have your Heavenly Father trying to guide you in this sinful world. This was a way to help the people of Israel understand the concept of clean and unclean. Holiness and unholiness. So before we jump into it, we have to understand the different types of the laws. Three different types of laws that are discussed in the book of Exodus are the civil or declarative law, the Levitical or the uh, criminal laws, Deuteronomic or the constitutional laws. A lot of us are familiar with Dr. Randy Smith and Sebring. GCBI, he does a great job understanding this. And, and his video really helps you out. So, without the aspect of the laws and the commandments, it'd be like the apocalypse. I mean, I love the apocalypse movies, you know. The world's ending, fire, brimstone, you know. Everything comes back but it would be utter destruction. And this is how it was comparable to the nation of Israel before these different laws. So the civil laws. 
They're covered in Exodus and Numbers are in helping the nation of Israel to understand how to live together, which is similar in our culture together. You know, we have our noise ordinances. You know, don't play loud music at dark. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, don't play loud music. You know, what I mean, stop at all the stop signs, not just the ones on the roadway. I mean, there's a reason for the laws. It's there for our safety. I mean, it's not just because someone decided to go pen and paper and say, okay, we're not going to, uh, we're going to make it hard for you. The importance of the civil laws is show the importance of what our Heavenly Father considered important. These fundamental laws are expressed in the Ten Commandments and Exodus 20 covers the core principles. The principle in the ideal of civil laws is that we don't have them, it's how we interact with each other. It would be utter chaos. You would go to the store, you know, get your loaf of bread or your dog food, and instead of you handing your de uh, debit card, you'd be like, Ch -ch -ch. "Okay, I'm just gonna shoot you." It wouldn't. It wouldn't be fair to the guy who stocked the shelves, the cashier. I mean, you're going. You're taking the, the, those people's livelihood. That's that's the reason why we have those laws now. Not everyone follows them, but <laughs> the causes this causes an injustice in the livelihood of the people. That one action affects many. So if we don't follow the basic social norms and the laws that surround it, we would hurt ourselves, others, and our heavenly Father. The criminal codes or the Levitical Codes, are known as the Atonement Laws, and they deal with the violation against the lawful authority of God. The Israelites were going against the very nature of God. They were taking something that was good, that he created, and they were worshipping it instead of God. They were spitting in the face of their Heavenly Father. They had lost the fact that the Almighty God created the heavens and the earth, completely nothing out of, not even space, a nano, nano, nanosecond the plants, the trees, everything. They're taking the divinity out of our Heavenly Father and placing it on earthly items. Additionally, the uh, criminal codes deal with how to care and feed the criminals in the world. This can be applied to the slave owners and the slaves. We know from uh, Pastor Rich's teaching uh, in the New Testament that the Apostle Paul was chained up to a smelly, burly guy. It was not exactly comfortable, and the food was not very good. This doesn't mean that uh, prisoners should be treated like a Ritz-Carlton, but there has to be some level of decency. This is the concept to understand that try and take the greatness of God and take it away. People of Israel are trying to not follow the laws and customs of their culture. That involved how they did business with each other. The last type of law is the Deuteronomic or Constitutional Law. I was getting there. Thank you. <laughs> they're, breaking in, they're broken down into three speeches loaded in, as the name says, Deuteronomy. You got Deuteronomy uh, 1, 16 to 443. The second speech is Deuteronomy 444 to 26, 19. And the third and final speech, Deuteronomy 27, verse 1 through 30, and then 31. This was the laws that divine what a good Jew did. It was to be uh, true and obedient to society. This would be related to treat others how you want to be treated. You know, the golden rule. Jesus covered this on the Sermon on the Mount and how we are to be believers. The constitutional law covered covered something that was a mile long. It ranged from the obedience and commandments of the customs to worship life in the cities of refuge in Deuteronomy 19. Crimes and investigation and warfare regulations. Warfare regulations. It covered everything. Or better known as rules and engagement. However, this was just the beginning. Respecting your parents. Premeditated murder of your neighbor and property. You have Israel out in the wilderness. You know, they're just kind of hanging out. They took a left turn at Albuquerque. 
when they should have taken a right. And God saves them from slavery. They're just kind of hanging out there. The account of Moses is a historical narrative. He's telling us about this. He's telling a story and showing us a method to the madness and the reason to why they're out there for so long. The people of Israel were having a hard time understanding that they were the chosen people. They were the select people. They were to show the other nations how they should act. They were the role model. The guy in the front of the class that, you know, got straight A's and messed up the curve for everyone. I wasn't going to say it, but yes, Sabrina and Miss Kate. <laughs> they were to be the poster boy. They decided they were going to follow the world instead of being above the world. The events are shown to be written by Moses in the book of Exodus, where we're going to go into detail. It was written around the time, 1446 B.C., which was after the encampment at Mount Sinai. And later chapter, you find out in Moses, in Exodus 32, Moses breaks the tablets. He's that mad because they're worshiping uh, golden calves at the foot of the mountain. They're stubborn and they keep turning to the uh, material items of the supreme being except God himself. So Exodus 1 through 3. Oops. Oh, there's what I was talking about. And God spoke all these uh, words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. The Israelites had countries all around them worshipping other false gods. They were worshipping the sun, the moon, you name it, they were worshipping it. They even had a god of unknown gods. We as humans are trying to replace our creator. How many of us have had a kid that says, hey, don't play in traffic. Don't put a fork in the electrical outlet. It's okay, I was that kid too. It took two times. But there, there's a reason. I mean, you tell someone to do something, they're going to do the complete opposite. But you have to be creative in how you tell them. God has gotten to a point where he is showing the country Israel that he rescued them from slavery in Egypt through plagues and other trials. However, they still want to worship everything and everything except the supreme being God. They are worshiping golden calves at the foot of Mount Sinai when Moses is talking to God, who God is writing the Ten Commandments. Our Heavenly Father is not supposed to be one of many gods, but the only God. It's not Jesus plus. It's not, you know, I'm going to worship God and social media. Or, you know, God and, you know, um, some other God, you know, hanging out on the, other, on the other side of the world. Only one God. Our Heavenly Father is a jealous God. I know that in the year 2019, Southwest Florida, we're not worshiping the sun or a Greek God or, you know. So how does it relate to me? I mean, this was written a long time ago. So how do we get it into this century? Anything that replaces God is an idol. I mean, it could be anything. If we accept his gifts of salvation and then do our own way of things, then you can't, you can't live on both ways. God is an all-powerful and all-knowing God, Yahweh, showing that he's the only God in these God's that your people worshipping are not the real thing. He controls the heavens and the earth and every aspect of the universe. This is something that always shows the power of God for me is Jesus is in the womb of Mary. You know, he's a he's a baby. But he's also he's also controlling the rains, the crops, everything else. So we have an all-powerful God that doesn't put any effort into it. He doesn't need help from anyone else. The first commandment to have no other gods before me and the second commandment to not have carved images are closely related. They're kind of like cousins. So we're going to uh, dive deep into it. Second commandment. 
You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, your Lord God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers of the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So like I mentioned earlier, we don't have carved images. We have something even more powerful. We have social media. How many of us, you know, we're bored or we're in the bathroom, we're strolling through Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, you name it, it's out there. But the moment that takes you away from God, that's an idol. I mean, it could be a relationship. It could be your job. I mean, we all have to eat. I mean, we all have bills. But that's why our relationship with God is the most important. Don't worship the creation, but worship the creator. The Israelites were trying to worship something instead of the true God. They decided, let's worship the uh, byproduct of the creator. Someone that was that loved us so much he sent his son to die on a cross. I mean, we didn't deserve it. I mean, we, we deserved the opposite. So let's look and see what the text says. The original Hebrew, uh, if you look into it, is, is so much more powerful and not watered down. Nothing will make or cause you to have an idol in any form, likeness in the sky or land. Anything that's going to take your attention and love away from the Father is an idol. I admit in this world it's easy and it will be a challenge. It's not, unif it's not all rainbows and unicorns. I mean, no one had a, I gave you a bumper sticker that said, being a Christian is easy. I mean, life, life as a believer is hard, but would you rather have 60, 70 years of hardness versus uh, eternal damnation? I'll pick the 60, 70 years. Verse 5, you shall not worship, serve any other god. God's ser clearly saying continuation previously. It's just stressing there's to be one God and not others' gods that they're worshiping. Don't worship their statues, their preachers, their books, you know. One God. Don't worship the person that's teaching you. Worship the Creator. There's nothing wrong with respecting a particular guy. I respect John MacArthur a lot. I mean, I... He's one of my go-tos, but don't worship him. Worship the God. God's glory and uh, love meant for him and placed it not, not on an individual, but on himself. Looking at the word jealous in Hebrew, nawa, it means fiery, protective, and unaccepting a disloyalty. Definitely puts it into perspective. We have a God that is so protective that he inflicts guilt onto the third and fourth generation of our ancestors. He's not messing around. He's not, additionally, he's not going to be accepting of disloyalty. There's no toe in the water and toe on the land. There's no, I'm a believer on Sunday and Monday I'm going to go curse at work and, you know, lie and cheat and steal. There's... God's way or the world's way? It's hard. I admit it. Believe me. <laughs> At work, it's interesting. You're going to face sinful uh, consequences of living with the sinful acts and deeds that they're completing. Verse 6. Showing unfailing love to thousands of generations of those that show great affliction and those who practice my commandments. Our Father in Heaven is not someone who wants to punish us. I know previously it seems like it, but not. He's, he shows us love and unwavering forgiveness. Not many people sacrifice their child. I mean, our, Kate and I's baby's not born, and I love, love the little girl already. 
probably going to cry like, like a, a baby. So to take that and say, look, my people, the ones that I created are more important, that, that has me thinking a lot. But we have to follow his commandments and only worship him. No other gods, no other idols, anything. I mean, it could be your phone. I mean, how many of us uh, are constantly on our phones? That's our generation. Right, Kenny? Yeah. I mean, it could be our phones, it could be social media, community events, our job, the local swap shop. It could be anything. I mean, it could even be what you do for the church. Is you can be so focused on serving others that you don't have that relationship. There's nothing wrong with this, guys. But the moment it replaces your relationship with God, you've turned something that God's created, something that's good and great, and you've turned it to be something that's sinful and wrong. And that's when you start moving away from God, placing your affection and your attention on something He created instead of the Creator. Believe me, I, I don't like missing Sunday mornings. Yeah, but I always ensure that I have my, my time with God in the morning. That's why I wake up so early on some days. It will not be easy, but nothing like life is easy. So the third commandment, Exodus 27, 20 verse 7. You should not take the name of your Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. He's the creator and the stainer of the earth. He could have killed us even before we are born. I mean, okay, I already know what you're going to do, so... So when, when you're using his name in a sinful and improper way, you're devaluing his name. The weight that goes on with it. Who watches Westerns? I mean, you, you know, they're, they're doing the cattle deal, and you know, they're, they're shaking their hands, saying, hey, you know, I'm going to give you X amount of cattle. And they spit in their hand, they shake their hand. Their words bond. I mean, they know that the other... Sorry, Chuck was doing faces. <laughs> you, you know that the other guy is not going to go back on his word. You know, you're going to make sure that you get what you're giving him. There's no, hey, you know, the next day, I really don't think I'm going to do that. It's done. It's been signed. The contract's been signed for it. So when you're using the Lord's name in vain, you're devaluing it. You're going back on the word, just like the cowboys. This is something that God repeatedly afterward is having to mention to his people. In Leviticus uh, 22, verse 1 through 2, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, so that the abstain from the holy things of the people of Israel, which they dedicate to me, so that they did not profane my holy name. I am the Lord. The Lord spoke to Moses, and he's saying, Do not profane my holy name. Don't devalue it. I am the Lord. I am God. Don't misuse it. I mean... Most people think when they say don't take the Lord's name in vain, OMG, JC, but it could be anything. Are we obeying the commandments that we have uh, when we have our stickers on our minivans and our cars saying uh, God is love? I mean, are we, are we being Sunday Christians? That's the thing. Everyone makes fun of me for it, but I see it every day at work. Sundays are the worst, too. <laughs> so when we're sharing the, the scripture of, you know, hey, share this on Facebook if you're a believer. Or, you know, if you don't share this, you're going to hell. Are we growing? Are we not growing and having a relationship with God? 
just like we have a relationship with each other, with our uh, friends, with our family. God's the same. Reading your Bible, praying, fellowship. I mean, my, my time early in the morning when I'm half awake with a monster in my hand at the desk, I love that time. Do our friends, family, co-workers, even the stranger in the mail guy know that we are believers? Are we sheep in wool's clothing? Are they like, hey, you're a believer? Something's up. But do we pray for our neighbors and give, gu and give them guidance, you know? Do you pray for uh, your co-workers or anyone that's struggling? We must use the Lord's name with purpose and with conviction. It's not for something negative or when you're angry or upset or, you know, you punch a wall. It's supposed to be good and holy. This is something at work that makes my blood boil. I've gone head to head with coworkers saying, look, I don't care what you say. Just don't, don't use uh, Jesus' name in vain. If you're going to do it, go in the cooler. And, you know, the lightning bolt. Exactly. They don't like me, but it's, it's the right thing to do. You have to speak up. I mean, I'm not very popular for it. But doing the right thing is not always the most popular way. There's another side of the coin that we do not think of, but the act of false prophesying. This might be the guy on TV, you know, says, hey, give me 20 bucks. I'll make sure you get into heaven. Or, you know, buy this book. Or, you know, you name it. We've all seen it. Or, you know, the, um, the guy who's trying to say the future. They're all around there and we're dealing with them regularly. The whole point is, the moment you use God's name improperly, you're, uh, you're using his name in vain. Jeremiah 23, verse 25 through 33. I have heard what the prophets have said, who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed. I have dreamed. How long shall there be lies in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies, and who prophesy the seat of their own heart? Who thinks to make my people forget my name by their dreams, and they tell one another, even as their fathers forget my name for Baal? Let the prophets who, have, who has a dream tell the dream, but let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with what, declares the Lord? It is not like my word, like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from one another. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who uses their tongues and declares, declares the Lord. God is clearly saying that this is wrong. You need to stop. You are the burden. So, we all know about uh, rabbit trails, right? We all go on them. Or hippopotamus trails. I went on one when I was preparing this message. In Hebrew... Uh, burden is translated to oracle, which means a shrine in which a DD reveals hidden knowledge or the divine purses through such a person. That guy on TV, you know, says, give me 20 bucks. He's trying to give the honor and glory to him, not to our Heavenly Father. He's trying to say, hey, I got the credit. It's all about me. They're claiming they're... Per they're uh, spreading the message of God, but they're just like the guy uh, you see on the apocalyptic movies. The end is near. The end is near. There's no difference. He, they're devaluing the name of God. Our God's a jealous one. Because, look, look at this way. He chose us. I mean, he chose us despite our flaws. He doesn't see all your 
cracks and everything held together by duct tape and super glue and rope and everything else. He sees the end product, the glorified product. I mean, he saw, he saw me when I had some work to do and <laughs> definitely some more work to do, <laughs> but no one's perfect. The fourth commandment, Sabbath. Verse 8 through 11. Behold, I am against those who prophesy lying dreams, declare the Lord, and those who tell them, lead my people astray by their lies. Oops. I must have put it in twice. Okay, oops. Now we're in the right one. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your sons, or your daughters, your male servants, or your female servants, or your livestock, or the sojourners who is within your gate. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all is in them, and rested on the seventh. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Why is it so important that we take a day of rest, a Sabbath? In Hebrew it means to cease, to stop. Spending, depending on what religion you are, if you're Jewish, you, you can't turn on a light switch. I mean, you can't do anything. There's some science for it. Why do you think uh, we only work five days a week? I mean, there's research that has been done that the harder and longer you work, the less productive you are. I mean, you can work a 60-hour work week, but you're only going to get 40 hours of actual productive work. Also, you have a higher risk of type 2 diabetes and heart disease. Burning both ends of the candle isn't good, and God did not intend us to do it. This is why Henry Ford invented the assembly line. He's also the one that invented the five-day work week. However, the purpose of the Sabbath is not just for our physical health but, and well-being. It's also for our spiritual health. It's a principle that even our creator and sustainer of the earth, he rested on the seventh day. He could have said, okay, one nano, nanosecond. All right, it's done. Plants, trees, you know, Adam's hanging out in the garden. Eve, you know. It's all hanging out. But no. He took six days and rested on the seventh. This is one, uh, one reason why we rest on the seventh day. Because it's that important. It's a relationship that needs to be watered and built. Sabbath is not something that's easy. I mean... Most type A personality guys are, you know, gun ho seven days a week. You know, you keep going until you collapse, and then you get up and you do it again. This is what the youth group kids uh, give me a hard time for. And Sabrina got me one day on this. <laughs> Was the Sabbath. Are you taking time? It doesn't have to be one entire day where, you know, you just sit on your hands on the bed. And you can't cook, you can't do anything. It's meant to have that relationship with God. I mean, when I was making this message, I'd work on it for a couple of hours on my day off, watch a favorite TV show. It's all about that balance. The moment we have work, sports teams, anything that's taken away from God, Instead of us having that relationship and that rest is the moment that we're not following it. This was not something to keep our health or spending some downtime uh, with our family. Rephrase. This is meant to have a relationship with our Heavenly Father and our family. If you don't have any uh, downtime, with your Heavenly Father, you kind of become grouchy and bitter. Working yourself to the bone is not good. 
And believe me, I've tried it. The key is to build time where you can relax. This is a principle that hits everyone. But every hard-working workaholic person eventually gets to the point where they need to say, hey, take some downtime, spend time with the kids or your other half, and spend time with God. The fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that your Lord is giving you. Fifth commandment, everyone has heard it. I mean, even non-believers know it. I mean, it's normally when, uh, when the kids are being bratty and not listening to you. Hey, you're supposed to honor me. But your parents are there trying to help you. I mean, they're trying to guide you. They're trying to mold you in something better. They're protecting you. They're teaching you. In Jewish law, if a kid disrespected their parents, they could be killed. John. <laughs> this is something very serious. I mean, they'd be like, where's Joey? Eh, sorry. And little John, you know, he's somewhere else. <laughs> but this was something very important to them. They took this to heart. Your parents do everything for you. And they want you to be your best. They want you to make the right choices. So... Most people, when they look at this, say, hey, what if my mother and my father has passed away? What if they're no longer with me? Do I get a freebie? I only got nine commandments? I got a fall? Oh, sweet. But nope, sorry. You, you don't get out of it. We have to look at the principle on what God's trying to convey. We have a Heavenly Father who created us, who gave us earthly people in our lives, you know, our in-laws, adults, other believers. I mean, depending on, on your boss, if you know, they're, they're good. It's these people that God's placed in your life to help you and sand off those rough edges or chisel them. I mean, it's not going to be easy. I mean, who, who likes to be told that they're wrong? I don't. The principle that is applicable to everyone. My, he placed those to help you grow. I mean, most, most people who are trying to help you aren't trying to beat you down and beat you like a redhead stepchild. They're trying to help you out. They're try, they, they see something bigger in you. I mean, they might have to beat you in the head a couple of times. No wooden spoons, please. Showing honor to your parents ensures that the very fabric of your family stays intact. I mean, you don't want that friction. Because the moment you don't honor your parents, we lose everything. Because the moment you do that, it trickles down. Look at our worlds. I mean, we can't discipline our kids half the time without the, uh, a fear of DCF being called. We want the best for our kids. And that doesn't mean that our kids are going to be the happiest in the world. They're going to grumble. They're not going to be happy with it. When you tell them, hey, you can't go outside and play. You have to do your homework. The time together and helping, the ch ch helping each other, children included, is a relationship. I mean... You might not like having to work on a project with your father or, you know, something else, but it's meant to build you as a person. To be honest with you, my father wasn't around. He liked, he wanted to be everywhere but around me. <laughs> but there's other people in your life. I mean, doing that reprogramming. Without that, uh, without that reprogramming, which is essential, you, use, you lose the fabric of it. Everything you do reflects your parents on earth and your Heavenly Father. 
If you're flipping off a car that you cut off, what's that say about your parents? I mean, hey, apparently they didn't teach him anything about road rage. So how can we take this away, you know, outside... (laughs) outside these walls because believers aren't meant to just kind of hang out inside church and you know be cocooned they're supposed to be a guidepost I mean a way to help you guide and mold into the image of God that sees us through the blood and filter of the blood of Jesus the point of this is to be able to understand it and take it in such a way that when you're in school you're at home, you know, you're driving, even the dreaded grocery store, that you understand the importance of these commandments. Because they're applicable everywhere. I mean, you just have to look at the principles that God is conveying through it. We can use these Ten Commandments in our daily lives, and they're endless. They help us be better humans and better believers. So the first takeaway... We, as Christ's followers, need to ensure that we have no other God or items that are coming before our Heavenly Father. This, this, could, this could tell me anything, but the idea is taking you away from that relationship. Is what takes you away from your Heavenly Father is terrible. And it's, you're just no better than the Israelites. You're worshiping a golden calf at the foot. But did the golden calf actually create you? Love you, nourish you, nurture you, I mean. It is so much more than how we place our time and our attention. This is a gut check. We all, we all need gut checks. Number two, we as believers need to ensure that we are not devaluing the name of God with our actions, speech, and deeds. It might seem like a pure phase that someone says when they're super excited or upset. Like, OMG, I got this new game. Or, I mean, you're really mad at work. You know, in the back room, you just start swearing off a storm. But you're taking a name that was meant for good and the holy of holies, and you're, you're valuing it down to something that is like the stuff that's on the bottom of my shoes at work. That's why I have to keep them outside. We must watch and be careful in how we act in speech because we are the models of Christ. We might be the only Christian or the only Bible that someone sees. I mean, you might not have a coworker that actually goes to church, but through you, they see God. They see you through your struggles and their love. Number three, <clears throat> remember the Sabbath and ensure that you're spending time with your Heavenly Father and those that He's placed with your life. Sunday dinners, one of my favorite. We are not to meant, we are not meant to work constantly. Yes, there are 24 hours in a day, but it doesn't mean that we have to work 23 and a half of them. We will be miserable and exhausted. We are commandment, commanded to take some downtime. I mean, wake up early. Study your Bible. I mean, even watch the sunsets. But that relationship with your, with your Heavenly Father, your regular family, and your loved ones, even your annoying co-workers. The point is, even our Heavenly Father understood and wants us to realize that we must work, but we also must rest. Number four, we must honor those that God has placed in our life that provides us guidance. I mean, this isn't just for the little kids. I mean, this is for everyone. I mean, you have a friend that's trying to help you through a difficult time. You have your parents that are trying to make you realize that you're not doing something right. They're looking out for you. They're not trying to beat you down. They're 
they were placed in our lives to help us grow into what God had envisioned us. You might, uh, you might have some crummy parents, but you have to show some respect to them, some honor. You don't have to love them, but you have to honor them. Next week, Lord willing, we're, we're going to be diving into the last five of the Ten Commandments. Key of this is to be, get back to understanding why we do what we do and the very fabric and what we are. This is the essen- essential into understanding why Jesus died on the cross. It all ties into each other. Something that's been explained in many ways, but essential for the growth of Christ followers. Conclusion. We as human beings have been messing up since the very beginning. You know, we just started our reading plan. (laughs) We've definitely been seeing it. Commandments are meant to be a guidepost to allow us to be better humans and believers. First five cover our relationship, our respect to our Heavenly Father, respecting our parents and those that He's placed with us. Understanding the laws that God has placed us for our well-being is not to hinder us or bog us down. It's not supposed to be a chain. So, hopefully next week, we're going to be covering uh, murder, adultery, stealing, false witnessing, and coveting your neighbor. These are meant to ensure that we are good humans and believers in Christ. All right, let's talk to God. Dear Lord, thank you so much for everything, um, for the ability to learn about you and understand what you meant and apply this to this day. Please be with our friends and our family in their health and their struggles, Lord, and have a great day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.